Alrighty, so for my UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning, um, I'm going to present to you about how I can use it for my lecture uh, for the unit that I'm providing and give a little background knowledge on what they are and how they're useful for students and how I plan on implementing it. So the main thing about uh, UDLs is that it's a good way to prepare for learner variability. Um, what I learned from the article and from the video is that uh, there's no such thing as the average learner. Teachers are always trying to prepare for what they think the average student is because they think that that's what you'll mostly have. But something I learned is that there is no actual average learner. Um, there's, every student is an individual, so there's no one average person that you're trying to teach to. Um, you might have like a narrow range of where you want to initially start your les lesson to prepare for how you think most students will be, but you want to actually teach to the individuals, not to your expectations of where they should meet in the middle, because each kid is going to learn different from the other kid sitting next to him or her. And so um, there can be a wide range of learners in your classroom. So just be prepared to teach the students that you have as individuals, not as a statistic that says, oh, well, most kids fall within this category. Because if you do that, you'll be teaching to hypotheticals and you won't actually be meeting the needs of the actual kids that you have in class. So Universal Design for Learning has a guideline. Uh, I provided a picture of it here. The main three aspects of it are providing multiple means of representation providing multiple means of action and expression, and providing multiple means of engagement. So as you can see here on this chart, it has a few ways it describes how these things are met. Like for example, the representation, it's got like opinions that customize the display of information, options that provide alternatives for auditory information, and so on. I'm not going to read through each one of these because I'm sure that we've all had the chance to look over this chart by now with being educators this is something that's really important to know because like I said uh, each student has their own individual way of learning so you want to make sure that you can meet all nine of these sections of the guidelines here to the best of your ability to make sure that you're not leaving any students behind or at the very least that you're trying to include the majority of them and their unique ways of learning so on the next couple slides here I go into a little bit more detail with what this means so for guideline number one, multiple means of representation, it's just really important to provide different ways to access information, yet to provide different options for perception. So some students, because um, we've all heard like, oh yeah, I'm a visual learner, oh yeah, I'm a hands-on learner, and stuff like that. Um, that's what this main thing is focusing on, is that you really, just because you learn something uh, by hearing someone explain it to you, does not mean that your students will learn that way. So you need to make sure that maybe they learn by visuals so when you're talking about something have an actual visual for it so they can see what this means to have it there or they can hear what it is and not just have it put up in writing that's where actually um, what I'm doing right now would actually be something really effective for having a PowerPoint or if I were to do like a flipped classroom aspect and that students would actually be able to hear my voice and not just read the words because the more different ways you can present information to students the better the chances are that they're going to be able to learn it. So providing both language and symbols or visuals helps too because some students might struggle with certain wording, but if they can see a picture of something, it can actually help them to gain uh, a little bit of perspective into what's being taught to them. Uh, guideline number two is uh, providing multiple means of action and expression. So different options for physical explanations. Some students, like I said, might be hands-on learners. So if you can have them actually like filling out something as they're learning, or taking notes or even just drawing a picture um, just as long as you can allow different ways to make sure that they actually understand what's occurring this just increases the likelihood of them taking in information along with hearing it um, and then for communicating like sometimes um, students they're going to do a really great job presenting in front of the class whereas some students fear talking in front of others more than anything else and they can write you an amazing essay so you just need to figure out what types of students you have and the main thing is to separate the means of communication from what's being communicated so make sure that you're judging students on what they've actually learned and not their ability to communicate it because a student might actually know the information extremely well they just don't know how to convey to you that they know the information so try to give them the options so that they can explain it to you the best way that they can 
because you don't want to judge them off of their ability to convey it. You want to judge them on whether they actually know it or not. So if you can find the right way for them to convey it, even if it's not the standard typical way that you were originally thinking, if they know the information, grade them off of what they know, not how they present it. Um, so the third one here is uh, multiple means of engagement. Uh, so the main points of this are uh, providing options for recruiting interest, providing options for maintaining interest, and providing options for self-regulation. So the main part of this is honestly just still using every type of means that you can to meet all of the senses and their perceptions so that students are actually engaged with what you're teaching. Make sure that's exciting for them. Whether that's just audio or visual, videos, students getting up and actually presenting stuff in front of the class, you dressing up as a character in a book, just provide is going outside even that can provide so much more meaning to students and the students who learn from powerpoints that's awesome they might not need this but so many students have such a hard time focusing on just a powerpoint and just a discussion in front of the class for 50 minutes or however long a class period may range that if you just provide so many more options for them it allows them to have such a better chance of taking in information Options for self-regulation, just make sure that um, if students are following along, make sure that they have something that they can do instead of just sitting there bored. If they can be engaged with what's going on, their level of focus is going to increase. Hopefully they're going to be interested and actually wanting to learn stuff, and you're just going to see much greater feedback. So um, some of the goals of this is to differentiate between knowledge and skill goals. So I kind of touched on this and that skill goals, for example, could be like writing an essay or creating a PowerPoint or putting together a rubric. Any type of actual like way to show a skill is a skill goal, whereas the knowledge is the specific content related to the material. So what the student actually knows. So if you're reading a book, like my lesson is going to be over Lord of the Flies. If we're talking about that and I want to understand whether the kids understand what has happened in the book, and I want them to explain that to me in the form of an essay, well, maybe some kids are really good at writing an essay, but they don't really know what happened in the book. So I might get a heck of an essay. Format might be on point. They might have great grammar. But the actual content is not going to be what I want it to be. Their knowledge isn't there. And then there might be another student who can, if I'm talking to them, they can tell me backwards and forwards what happened in the book, every aspect of it. They, can re they might have all of the 30th page of the book completely memorized. But their writing just is not there in terms of communicating this. And they might not do well in this assignment just because they don't know how to convey the information in the form of an essay. This is where it's so important not to mix goals. If you're doing a skill goal, such as writing an essay, allow students to choose the topic of their essay. Make it so that they're as comfortable as they can be with the knowledge to show whether they actually have the skill or not. Whereas um, in uh, opposition to that, if the goal is knowledge, provide different ways for them to show this knowledge. Don't make it just an essay if essays aren't their strong point and you just want to know whether they actually understand the book or not. Allow them to talk about it. Allow them to give a presentation. Maybe they want to act it out together in a skit. Maybe they just want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Or maybe this essay is the perfect way for them to explain it. Just make sure that you give them the option and the platforms to explain what they want. Don't mix these goals. Because if you mix a skill goal and a knowledge goal, you might only be judging one of the two of them. The reason I have a Rubik's Cube here is, um, actually you talked about it in the video that we watched, in that some students, they might understand the concept of a, Ru of a Rubik's Cube, but maybe they can't see color. So how are they supposed to be able to get these colors together, even if they know the way to twist it, if they can't actually understand what colors they're trying to go for that's where like maybe having like a pattern or braille or something on the Rubik's Cube allows them to actually show their knowledge and the skill is putting it together, but they can't display this skill if they can't actually understand or comprehend what they're trying to do. So it's just really important to think about all different types of students you might have in class and make sure you're providing them the opportunities to succeed. So like I said, my lesson is on Lord of the Flies. Um, the main thing about this lesson, it's centered around understanding the context of theme of the book, as well as related vocabulary. I have a bunch of uh, juniors in this class who are preparing for the SAT, so there's a lot of vocabulary that we're trying to go over right now in sentence structure 2 to make sure that they're prepared for doing well on that.
So the first source that I had was uh, Lexipedia. This online source works as an outline or as an online th thesaurus. It can be used to find words with the same meaning as vocab words from the book, and it builds off a prior vocab and sentence structure because the type of word is explained as well as the definition. I provided an image for it in the top right here. Uh, the relationship to UDLs for this is um, that it has color-coded words, which helps you to know what part of the sentence is and whether it's like an adjective, a verb, and so on. So it provides synonyms and definitions for the word to help explain it. It's easily accessed on laptops that are provided to my students at my placement. The only problem with this site is that it doesn't actually have any um, audible uh way for it to be explained to students so without any audio it's missing students who might have difficulty with reading or writing um, beyond that though it's a really good way for if I'm explaining it for them to have a visual as well and it gives like a kind of spidery map there so students can just hover over what part it is and what they want to learn so it's very easy to navigate another source here is vocab ahead this source is similar to the thesaurus site with additional features that coincide with the lesson and they're going to help provide my 11th graders for the SAT. Um, it provides words that are likely to appear on the SAT like it actually has an understanding of what words are likely to be up there. Um, I provided another image in the upper right here such as serrated. It gives you a definition of what it is and it gives you a picture so it provides even more feedback for students. Um, Teachers are allowed to choose which words or come up with the words that are already generated. And in addition, it provides 30 to 60 second video clips for the words. So like where it has this shark and the fish here, it would actually give a video of uh, like a shark chasing a fish and explaining in detail what serrated means and giving a few examples of it. Additionally, this site is awesome because it provides quizzes and games that keep the, uh, track of the progress the students are making so they can actually see where they're improving. Uh, the UDL relation in this is that it has written, verbal, and visual representation for words. It allows different interpretations. Different games keep students interested, and it provides um, opportunities for them to meet their knowledge goals in different ways. So like how I was saying, different students are going to be able to express their knowledge in different ways. This provides it for them. Um, it's untimed and allows for unlimited retries, so students don't have to feel pressured to get it right the first time. And it also even has a free download on Android and Apple, and most of my students have these products. So they don't have to feel rushed to get it done in class. They can do it at home if they feel that they need more time. My third source was uh, ThingLink. This allows for the insertion of images and hyperlinks within the image to give explanations of the image. Again, I have another uh, copy in the upper right here. It can be created by either teachers or students, and that's what I love about it is that... Um, for like uh, Lord of the Flies, if they find symbols in it and they want to put visuals, then they can put these little links here and you click on the um, visual and then it gives you a definition. So this allows for the UDL relation to this, it allows for students to model an example already provided by me or by uh, my CT and uh, so they can see what we want because I can provide one and then I can have them provide their own. It provides additional information for students to show their knowledge of materials because they come up with pictures that relate and words that relate, so it's different ways to show it. Uh, just written descriptions coincide with the pictures, and these images uh, can be read off to the class. So there's just a bunch of different ways for students to interpret the information and show off what they know and provide it to other students. So just a lot of different ways to intake information. And so you can reach a lot more students, and hopefully they'll be able to gain from at least one of these ways of showing it. So... Um, the main point of UDLs here is that these interactive online sources that I provided help to provide students with additional platforms to interpret information and to show their understanding of the information that they have learned. The more ways a student can take in information or express their knowledge, the more ways that student is likely to learn. So the more opportunities they have to learn, the more likely that at least one of them will stick. So students with special needs, visual impairments, um, I'm going to go through this quickly just because I think I'm running out of time for this, but uh, visual impairments um that's where the hearing and the representation allows to help um hearing impairments it has the visuals as well and stuff is written so they don't have to hear as well also students can bring this stuff up on their laptop so it's close to them so that's what helps with visual impairments or hearing if they need it close add and adhd if it's provided in different ways so it stimulates the senses and reading or writing that's where the different ways to like draw pictures and stuff like that allows them to um, work around these deficiencies that they may have and that they're developing. So just the different ways that all these senses are met, it helps prevent one low area from completely crippling a student's chances at being successful. I also have a copy here of my sources. 
Um, that's the article that I read and the links to my sites. So that's what I got. Hopefully it was very insightful. Thank you.